think about how different our world would be if we all said, how can I be more invested rather than less? How can I care more about the other rather than only about myself? How can I find ways to be more inclusive rather than more excluding? Those are fundamentally different ways forward, but they are a difference. I suggest, and this is my Camping with Kierkegaard book inspired by Levinas and Kierkegaard. I would suggest this is why faithfulness as a way of life, holiness as a way of life is a fundamental movement into transcendence rather than getting the transcendent and then being able to articulate it and pin it down like a moth on a you know, child science fair. The following is a conversation with Dr. Aaron Simmons on the topic of Levinas's works and ideas. Dr. Aaron Simmons is a professor of philosophy at Fermin University and is a leading scholar in the field of existentialism, especially in relationship to the work of Kierkegaard and Levinas. He is an author and editor of nine books and over a hundred articles and essays, and it's a great privilege to have him onto the channel. You can follow his information at his website, which will be found in the link below, and also his YouTube channel, Philosophy for Where We Find Ourselves. Hope you enjoy this episode, and let's get right into it. Who was Levinas? Yeah, so Levinas is a Lithuanian-born Jewish philosopher. Uh, he was born in 1905 or 1906, depending on the calendar that one uses. Um, typically, in uh, the sort of calendar that is now standard for us, it'd be 1906. He died in 1995. And so Levinas was a philosopher who early on began to discover German philosophy on the backside of the work that he had done on some of the Russian um, literary masters. So he talks a lot about Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and others who had influenced him, obviously coming out of a Lithuanian context. He also is a serious Jewish thinker and practicing Jew himself. And so he was also influenced very deeply by the Jewish philosophical and theological traditions. So if you combine sort of these Russian literary greats, Jewish theological um, archive, and then early German continental philosophy, especially Edmund Husserl and Martin Heidegger, you begin to see the sort of big philosophical and theological and literary influences on what became um, Levinas. And so he... Interestingly, though he was, again, Lithuanian, he wrote exclusively in French. Um, his first book was actually a book thinking about and introducing the philosophy of Edmund Husserl. It's a um, book dealing with the theory of intuition uh, in Husserlian phenomenology. So phenomenology is definitely the method by which to understand Levinas's philosophical project. And then some interesting things happened. He, he went to study with Husserl ends up discovering Heidegger, gets, of course, sort of enamored with Heideggerian philosophy, but finds some really big problems in Heideggerian philosophy. And also uh, Heidegger himself, uh, obviously, with a, a very complicated moral history in relation to World War II and anti-Semitism. And so Levinas wrote a book um, in the early 30s where he's talking about trying to find what he calls escape. And the French title is De la Vision, or On Escapes, the way it translates to English. And in this book, Levinas basically announces the philosophical project that would occupy his whole life. And it's the question, is transcendence possible? Right. And so this question of how is it that we are able to get out of what he understood to be the totalizing narrative of being, articulated by Heidegger, and then also we might say articulated by somebody like Hegel, right? Where everything is uh, able to be understood in a system, everything's able to be, you know, uh, gotten around, you know, everything's circumscribed. So he calls this totality. And one of the worries he has is that if totality is all-consuming, if we can never get outside being, if we can never get anywhere other than where we find ourselves, part of the problem is that transcendence then becomes impossible. Everything would be a philosophy of eminence. Now, some thinkers, Nietzsche, Deleuze more recently, um, are big fans of eminence, right? And the idea that radical eminence becomes actually the focal point is a, you know, kind of sexy way to think about some contemporary French philosophy. Levinas was more interested in the philosophy of transcendence. 
And he articulates this philosophy of transcendence by saying, how is it that we are able to encounter or experience or make sense of alterity? And alterity here is just a kind of, you know, $10 word for otherness, for difference. Well, he writes this book on escape and tries out some different ways to think about how we could escape the totality of being. And he's not entirely convinced that uh, what he's articulated there works. You know, it's kind of one of those like, you know, early books where you're trying out an idea to see where it lands. But he writes this, of course, in the early 30s, and then World War II <laughs> interrupts everything. And he ends up actually a prisoner of war um, and ends up in a, a POW camp there in France. <laughs> and in fact, because he had joined up with the French military uh, to some degree, this is what allowed him to avoid uh, the death camps and the Holocaust. And he was sent basically, you know, with more of the French prisoners of war and was able then um, to survive, though it was certainly a very, very difficult time period. So he spent several years in prison. And while in prison, he wrote another book called Time and the Other. It gets published in 1947, if I'm getting the date right. <clears throat> and in that book, what he does is continues to play with this idea of escape, of alterity, of transcendence. But he tries a different way to make sense of it. And so he set, thinks about things like, um, you know, the erotic relationship. Maybe in eros, in real desire for the other person, maybe this is where I transcend the trappings of being. I somehow am able to rethink myself and my relationship to the world. And he writes this book, gets released from prisons on the other side, obviously, of the Holocaust in World War II. Many of his family dies in the Holocaust. Um, his immediate family is actually sort of um, saved by being moved out of the country by some other philosophers. It's, it's a harrowing story of sort of how he makes it through, how his immediate family survives. And when all this occurs, he's now out. He has thought about Eros as this way forward. But then he starts to realize that that's not going to work because in the erotic relationship, you end up what he calls coupling with the other in a way that then just changes the register or the domain of how being plays out. But it doesn't really get us to something otherwise than being. We just now shift from radical singularity to a kind of couple. And so he keeps trying different ideas. And then in 1951, he writes what I consider to be the seminal essay for his mature philosophy it's a little essay called Is Ontology Fundamental? And it's in this essay that we really see the nugget that will become all of Levinas's mature ideas when he says the problem with the history of philosophy is that it's been grounded in a commitment to ontology as the fundamental story, right? Ontology being this narrative of being, what it means to be, Heidegger called, you know, fundamental ontology the basic task of being in time. Levinas says, is the, the most basic reality my being? Is that actually what grounds me? And in that little essay, Levinas inverts it and says, what if it turns out ontology doesn't go all the way down, but instead ethics shows up as deeper than being? In other words, what if responsibility shows up as prior to my own freedom? What if my being emerges not as the ground of my ethical life, as it had been for pretty much all of Western ethical theory? What if instead I am responsible before I find myself a being capable of taking up that responsibility? And he describes this relationship of ethics as first philosophy by basically saying that the other person ends up being what he says as phenomenologically confronted as face or le visage. Now, the face of the other is not, you know, the nose and mouth and increasingly graying beard. The face of the other is, you might say, the depth dimension by which the other counts as such, is the way he puts it in his ontology fundamental. 
So the other does not count on my terms, nor does the other and I count on beings' terms as instantiations of these particular manifestations of some universal concept. Again, think uh, Hegel here, right? Or even Heidegger, we are both Dasein, right? And Dasein becomes the category ontologically by which we then are able to be made sense of. We don't signify as Dasein. We don't signify as instances in the articulation of the absolute, a la Hegel. Levinas says the face of the other signifies and counts as such, purely on its own terms. This is a really big deal, right? Now, it sounds like an unbelievably abstract metaphysical play, but this is a huge deal because what if it turns out that my relationship to the other person is not an afterthought of my identity, but it's actually what gives rise to my identity as a response to that moral or ethical call? If Levinas is right, maybe now we have the access to transcendence. How is it that we get outside of the totality? Well, not by leaving the totality, right, They're going somewhere else, but by recognizing internal to the totality of being in which I find myself existing and narrate my life, there is already what he'll call the infinity of the face that ruptures the self-sufficiency of my ego, of my identity. So the upshot of Is Ontology Fundamental is this idea that we are no longer able to be grounded on our own freedom, self-sufficiency, and wholeness. We are in our most deep self, ruptured by and constituted by the encounter with the other. Ethics goes all the way down. And that then gives rise to Levinas's big books, which then articulate this in a little bit more detail as he's now found the nugget, right? Totality and infinity comes out and then later uh, otherwise than being. And those two books are really kind of the, the what, the you know, magnum opi, right? The, the, the magnum opus of his life, of his work. And along the way, through his whole philosophy, he's also kind of like Kierkegaard, who wrote uh, these upbuilding discourses, the religious texts alongside his philosophical texts. Levinas actually writes a series of Talmudic readings where he's doing something very similar to Kierkegaard. So as he's working all of this out philosophically, inverting ontology, putting ethics at the ground of everything, rethinking selfhood, he's also articulating all of this, as in his language, a radically Jewish understanding translated into Greek language. And so that's more or less the big insight of Levinas's philosophy. And then, of course, he's going to take it in a bunch of directions and put it into application and then wrestle with a bunch of objections. But that idea, ethics as first philosophy, not ontology, that's the, the inverted move. That's where if Levinas matters, it's going to be because that idea radically overturns the way we make sense of ourselves in our moral and political lives. Mm. That's a really brilliant analysis or introduction to who Levinas was and his ideas. And throughout this interview, we we're going to tie in and really narrow down on some of the individual ideas that um, you've just talked about. But perhaps to get started off, you've talked a bit about how Levinas critiqued the contemporary philosophy of the time. And I suppose what we're thinking about is the this, this shift to ontology, I suppose, from Hegel to Heidegger. And you're really talking about ontology, what it does it mean to be in the world? And he's trying to go move away from that to ethics as first philosophy. Perhaps what the question, what question I have here is not only what Levinas had as a critique of, of, of philosophy at the time, but also perhaps how that critique would or would not apply to perhaps philosophy before it. For example, maybe Aristotle's yeah. Nicomachean ethics, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, where it's about how one can live a life of a, a good life which moves towards eudaimonia via habit or maybe natural moral law. How would uh, Levinas kind of interact with those thinkers and what was his approach towards perhaps the ethical landscape or contributions of the past? Yeah, it's a good question. So um, 
I think there's two ways in which to kind of situate Levinas in relation to the history of philosophy. The first is regarding what we might call the history of Western ontology. Now, Levinas is not new uh, critiquing that history. It turns out, ironically, Heidegger was also critiquing that history. So Heidegger's account of fundamental ontology was an attempt to go back, rethink Plato's uh, story, get underneath it to what he calls the questions that animated Platonism as a response and kind of, you know, restore this pre-Socratic awareness of the question of being as something that is still present in our day, even though we've covered over or forgotten that question. So we see that kind of, um, you know, going deeper than the history. In Heidegger, we see something similar in Nietzsche, who's, of course, trying to go back to the Dionysian influences that got erased, he thinks, by Platonism and Christianity. We see something similar even in Kierkegaard, who's trying to, again, rethink what it means to understand selfhood and subjectivity on the other side of the objectivism that had become all the rage in German idealism. So Levinas, I would say, when it comes to his rethinking ontology, though he does it in a radically new way, he's actually in a kind of historical lineage of doing that uh, for the, you know, 150 years or so prior to his own work. So in that sense, he's both radically challenging that history and also participating in the more recent history of trying to get underneath, go back to the original sources. You know, what was it that gave rise to this tradition? On the other side, however, we can think about this as a contribution to moral philosophy. And if we read him as doing this, and, and again, both of these go together, right? His, his moral contributions are precisely a challenge to a very particular history of ontology. But his moral philosophy is really challenging a very particular history of moral thinking being grounded in an idea of the ego as stable as for foremost, as first. So think about it. There are three traditional big moral philosophical theories. Um, on the one hand, we've got some version of consequentialism, right? And the big classical players would be John Stuart Mill, Jeremy Bentham, and others. And consequentialism says, I am moral insofar as I am able to think about this equation of everybody counting as equal, and then trading off our pleasures and our plain, uh, pains, our pleasures and our displeasures, to come to the right moral activity being the one that maximizes pleasure, minimizes pain in a particular kind of utilitarian way in this version of consequentialism. But there are other consequentialisms. Uh, I would even suggest that Nietzsche is a kind of consequentialist relative to egoism. Ayn Rand is a kind of egoist consequentialist where do those things that allow you to maximize your own ego in particular ways that benefit yourself. Well, notice the difference, of course, between consequentialism and deontology. Here, the big thinker being Immanuel Kant. For deontologists, the idea is not so much how do I maximize the right sorts of consequences, but it's how am I doing my duty as obligated by my rational nature, that I can learn through uh, thinking about my moral life how to then be moral. But notice both of these options, deontology and consequentialism, are rooted in the powers of my own ego to be moral. I am defined by these moral tasks, by these moral obligations, but only as modes in which to live out what I already am. The ontology is precisely what gives rise to the narrative of reason and autonomy for Kant and give rise to the narrative of, you know, algorithmic rational capacities and judgment in consequentialists. Then we've got, you mentioned Aristotle, you know, a kind of um, <clears throat> virtue ethic history, right? And this is going to be more about developing one's character in relationship to a particular kind of moral practice as anchored in, notice, the type of being that I am. So there is no virtue ethics without already understanding 
that virtue is appropriate to the type of being that I live into. I am defined by the capacities for certain notions of virtue. And then I've got to instantiate those via practice and habit to develop those character traits, right? But all three of these classical theories of ethics are grounded in the foundational understanding of a story of being, a story of selfhood, out of which emerges a particular account then of how we live most appropriately by being ethical. Levinas really does challenge this history of moral philosophy by suggesting the idea is not that I find myself fully capable of being moral and then I either develop practice guided by phrenesis, Aristotle, <clears throat> develop moral life by engaging in my rational nature and following the categorical imperative, Kant, nor am I running the philosophic calculus and the algorithm of pleasure and trying to then yield certain consequences. All of those views start with me being self-sufficient to be moral. And then the question is, will I advocate that morality as a proper discharge of my freedom, right? Yeah. Levinas says, nope. <laughs> what if we are responsible and freedom is the thing that is brought about because of the responsibility? What if my obligation to the other, phenomenologically, is first? It's all the way down. If that's the case, then egoism is fundamentally the problem. And he says at one point that ontology historically has been not much more than an egolatry, right? It's a devotion to narrating the ego with all its power, with all its rights, with all its dignity, in order then to go out and be concerned about the other person because they are like me. And notice, all of our moral theories kind of have that traditional view. I care about the other because they are like me. They are blessed with reason, blessed with judgment, blessed with a particular possibly developmental character. Levinas says, wrong. <laughs> I do not relate to the other person because they are like me. The other person constitutes me as a response to their moral demand. Now, you could immediately see, wait a minute, <clears throat> but who is this self that receives this command? Don't I have to exist? Don't I have to be free and rational and capable of understanding this in order to take it up? Levinas wants to say the relation to the other is not an experienced event. It's not a thing that I am standing there bopping along down the road and, oh, shoot, I run into another and I'm now constituted as ethical. His whole point is this is a this is this is the way I talk about it, at least. This is a quasi-logical condition of possibility for our moral experience not just being reducible to egoism. So let's flip that backwards, and I think it'll make more sense. What if we start by saying, I phenomenologically, Levinas is a phenomenologist, I experience myself morally engaged in the world. I see the homeless man on the side of the street asking for money. I see the person with the flat tire. Do I stop to help them? I see the student asking for extra credit. I see the starving child. Like, you know, ad infinitum, we are confronted with moral dilemmas. What ought I to do? Levinas says, when we understand the phenomenology of the ethical experience of what ought I to do, we now can then recognize that all of the history of philosophy has answered that question by throwing us back onto our own ego. Levinas says if it reduces to a kind of ego power, then we have never again achieved that kind of transcendence that makes possible seeing the other as other. What if it's the opposite? Maybe the condition of the possibility of that ethical phenomenological experience is that I have already been ruptured by and constituted by the other person saying, not so fast, 
It's not about you. The way Levinoff puts it is the first word of the other is don't kill me. Now, that can seem pretty harsh, but what he means is we are constituted in our selfhood as a response to the restriction on self-sufficiency. So I am not originally self-sufficient, and then because of some social obligation or social norm or moral you know, exchange, I limit my freedom. Think social contract theory. It's instead... The state of nature, as it were, is as always already confronted by the other, regardless of my actual historical experiences. So that's why it's a quasi-logical condition. And he says we are always too late for our consciousness to show up for the ethical encounter. Our consciousness is a response to an emergence from that encounter. It's not there encountering it. And so maybe the last thing I'd say to kind of, you know, finish this, how do we relate him to the history of Western moral theory? What if we said <clears throat> the only way that we are able not to be duped by morality, which is Levinas, the way he puts it at the beginning of Totality Infinity, if we are not duped by morality, in other words, what if morality just is egoism? Well, then we were duped, <laughs> right? We thought it was all about the other. It was really just self-concern. What if we're not duped? What would be the case for us to really be constituted by obligation? And his answer is his philosophy of the other. Ethics would have to be first philosophy. And therefore, the history of philosophy gives us absolutely fantastic assistance in thinking about so now how then do we live in light of the social historical contingent requirements of lots of people? And that's what Levinas calls politics. So ethics, me and the other constituted by the call, my freedom is then instantiated as a response. Politics, oh shoot, <laughs> There are a bunch of others. He calls this the third, Latia, right? There is, there's three people. As soon as I've got three people, now I've got to make a decision. Well, shoot, do I give Joshua my money or do I give it to Susie? Do I give you half a sandwich and her half a sandwich? Do I eat all the sandwich? Like, notice now I've got a real question of we might call distributive justice. And these questions of distributive justice are for Levinas a matter of what he calls politics and elsewhere he'll call it justice. Ethics is morality, politics is justice. And that's where certain versions of Kantian life, certain conceptions of natural theory, uh, natural rights say, certain models of consequentialist debates, all of that now can show up not as ethical questions, but as particular views on how best to um, adjudicate these conflicting claims that all are part of what it means to be me. So now I might say the best way forward in our political lives in history is to ask, can I will my personal maxim as a universal law? Or to ask, can I instantiate these habits in a particular way to maximize the character traits that I want to foster among all? But the thing that motivates the debate among these more, you might say, um, political conceptions of life, what motivates that is the idea that egoism is a problem, not an answer. That ontology is secondary, not first. So he's given us, you might say, not an applied ethical vision, He's giving us a phenomenology of the possibility of ethical life making sense. So that's the general way I think he situates in relation to the history of philosophy. I suppose when I was thinking about this, we're hearing a lot about the other here. And in, in, in a lot of thoughts throughout <clears throat> in the past, either be it in psychology or philosophy, the idea of the other shows up a lot. It, for example, in Lacan, there's the idea of the big other and then the small other, the big other being some sense of a representation of this symbolic structure of, of society and the small other being over some, some small reflection of oneself and you kind of found who you are is kind of in between those different concepts. And, mm -hmm. and likewise, in a lot of other thinkers, this idea of the other does show up. So I suppose what 
I we can turn to now is well, what is the like Levinas's view of the other? What does the other mean to Levinas? Is it just the other people surrounding you, or is it almost this yeah. bigger concept which encapsulates the whole totality of the other? Yeah, and I, I will say there, there's some debate on this. Um, mm -hmm. So I'll give you what I consider the you know standard standard view. Uh, standard view goes something like this: the other. Uh, L'autre in French is different than simply l'autre. Um, and the difference is there are all kinds of things that are other than me. So the cup out of which I am drinking is other than me, right? The cell phone upon which I make calls is other than me. So alterity can just be a kind of phenomenology of objects. The difference between self and other objects. And in many ways, this is what we find in Heidegger. So in Heidegger, he'll make the distinction between, you know, objects that are ready to hand, present at hand, the way that they show up as equipment. And then he says about Dasein, they are part of the fabric of my world. They are other objects, but they're distinctive objects. They are objects who have the same mode of being that I find in myself. So other Dasein emerge as a particular kind of object insofar as I'm able to recognize this shared uh, mode of existence. We see something similar in Martin Buber, who differentiates between other objects that are it beings and objects that are thou beings, which again is this distinction, other beings like me versus other beings unlike the kind of being that I and other beings like me have. Well, for Levinas, he, when he's talking about the other in this moral sense, it is not simply a theory of objects. It's not just other stuff that is not me. He's talking about what is it that would invite the moral response that I call myselfhood. So here he's drawing on, uh, he says this explicitly, a Hebraic idea, this Jewish idea of God basically calling out, where are you? And the response is, you know, Hinei, here I am. So notice in this Hebraic account of God calling out, and we see this in two different places, of course, with Adam, you know, walking through the garden, Adam, where are you? Hinei, here I am. And then with Abraham on top of the mountain um, during the Akedah, Abraham, where are you? Here I am. In both of these moments, the here I am is a response to that which calls. So one of the basic ways his view of the other as other person, l'autre, is that which calls forth my selfhood as response. Now, <clears throat> that idea, of course, um, gets us a pretty long way down an interesting moral road. The question becomes, well, how far does that extend? And this is where Levinas introduces, again, a um, Hebraic Jewish idea of the neighbor, which then also, of course, is appropriated in lots of Christian ethics. Of course, Soren Kierkegaard makes a lot of neighbor love as the height of Christian moral life. When Levinas talks about loving the neighbor as oneself, as a kind of moral imperative, he says, well, who is my neighbor is an attempt, that question is an attempt to delimit or circumscribe the um, sphere of my moral obligation. And isn't this kind of how we all live, right? We all, we all say, you know, how can I make sure that I'm doing only what I'm required to do? And then if I do more, I want extra praise for it. Levinas is trying to actually say the neighbor, and he defines it this way, as the one who is near and far off. In other words, there is no mode in which we get to delimit who counts as a neighbor among the other people. They are all my neighbor. It's not just those who, again, think this kind of uh, Husserlian or Heideggerian like me language. It's not those who are like me because our kids play baseball together. Those who like me share an ethnic background. Those who like me have a particular sort of racial identity. Those who like me are the right kinds of uh, social class. 
all of those historical markers by which we would make sense of our historical existence and groupings of people, Levinas absolutely wrecks. He does this even to the point where he, he gets a lot of heat. So, um, you know, he will basically be asked about, well, you know, is there a limit of my responsibility? And Levinas' response is simply no. And so somebody says, well, what about, you know, your obligation to the SS officer? Surely you as Jew suffering at their hands don't have the same obligation. And his answer is really interesting. He says, because of my historical location, in other words, the experiences he's undergone, he said, I'm not the right person to ask. <laughs> right. Mm. But notice here he's splitting himself in this really cool way between Levinas, the philosopher, who has already said over and over and over, there is no limit, <laughs> right? The SS officer is not the SS officer, first and foremost, ethically. They are simply the other. There is no way to differentiate between the right others and the wrong others. But then Levinas, as a lived historical person, is saying, but that doesn't mean that I then can't politically, according to justice, make decisions about how to adjudicate between who gets my time, my energy, and my efforts, right? Mm -hmm. And so given the injustice in the world, I, the SS officer, maybe he was not at the top of that list. Do you see the, the way he's trying to mm -hmm. pull this apart, right? Yeah. Maybe to make this more relevant for us, you might say, well, what about the white supremacist? Are they the other? Well, the Levinasian philosophy is not going to say a white supremacist is the other. They're going to say the other can in history become distorted and misguided by an evil philosophical view that would reject all non-white others. So the other has gotten distorted in their historical practice, but it doesn't occlude them from being the other. Now, me, Aaron Simmons, in the world... Is the white supremacist my other? Well, the problem with this, of course, is, well, as a person who cares about racial justice, it's like, huh, I'm, I'm way more concerned about the victims of white supremacy <laughs> than I am about those perpetuating it, right? And yet, the only way that I can try to make sense of this as a vision of some sort of social reconciliation by which real charity is possible is to recognize, as he puts it, there is always charity after justice. Right. Sometimes we have to stand up to those others who are violent and threatening to other others and stop mm -hmm. them. But the goal is then to interrogate my own exclusion of that other and recognize, shoot, yeah, we have to stop that injustice. But in doing so, I'm also obligated to continue to see that person as other. And as an example of how we do this is think about like court systems in uh, democracies we have actually a really interesting idea. We say, oh, you're guilty of some horrible, horrible crime. We're going to punish you, right? We're going to lock you up. We're going to remove you from certain freedoms, whatever it might be. And we still recognize them, though, as the other person by saying, and we may have gotten it wrong. The appeal system remains. We mm -hmm. will continue to try to see your face if we have messed up, if we have not, in fact, done this appropriately. So Levinas is pretty um, slick, I think pretty wise at how he kind of gives us this absolutely all-inclusive account of who the other person is and the historical tools for realizing how hard this is then going to be to live out. Now, I'll say three things about pressure points, though, on this point. One, what about non-human others? That's a big issue. Uh, and there are Levinasians who suggest Levinas himself was not concerned about this, but his philosophy, actually, the other person is not limited to homo sapiens, right? It's not limited to, you know, other beings like us. Because again, we can't do that beings like us move. So therefore, the other is all sentient beings, right? Some go even further and say, no, 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 no. Why are we then saying sentience? That looks an awful lot like some sort of rational capacity. Levinas rejects that. So even ecosystems and climate, and we've got this radical obligation to care for that which is the context in which we find ourselves. So we get called by the mountains, right? John Muir famously, the mountains are calling, I must go. 
Well, maybe that call is a kind of ethical obligation. So non-human others is a real pressure point that lots of contemporary philosophers are trying to uh, move through. I hold my own views on this and I've written quite a bit about it, but uh, they're irrelevant right this second. The other pressure point would be, <laughs> is it the case though that Levinas doesn't allow for um, enough self-concern? So this is a critique that he gets from feminists in particular, but also you could motivate this critique from within uh, race theory, queer theory, etc., <clears throat> which basically says, look, Levinas really um, hits the you know nail hard on the head saying, I do not answer for the other's obligation to me. That is of no concern. My only concern is my obligation to the other. And at one point he even gets asked um, or, or he even says that I am responsible without end. I am responsible more than all the others. And here he's quoting Dostoevsky. We talked about his influence. Mm, yeah. Dostoevsky has this line where he says, we are all guilty before all, but I more than all the others. <laughs> right. Now you can see. That makes lots of sense as this phenomenological account of the quasi-logical conditions of moral. That makes no sense as a battered spouse. That makes no sense as a victim of sexual assault. That makes no sense as a victim of racial marginalization and historical injustice. Wait a minute. <laughs> right? Like, no. What about me? What about my status? What about the fact that I've been excluded and oppressed and marginalized? It seems like that's part of our ethical imperative. Levinas goes as far as to say we are responsible for the persecutions we undergo. That does not sit well with lots of contemporaries. Um, it, it's, uh, if I remember, I think it was Recur um, who even responds and says that this is a scandal. Um, so it, it's really problematic when you cannot frame limits on who counts as the neighbor because then you end up having to bite some big bullets that are really problematic about thinking, well, no, that neighbor can go screw themselves. I'm the one who should count. I'm the victim of this engagement. Levinas, again, creates an issue there, but his answer to it, whether it's a good one or not, we'll leave to others to uh, decide. Again, I've, I've given my answers to these things in lots of books, but he says it's in the political realm where we now get to count as an other for the others. Mm -hmm. As soon as we move away from that moral impetus that constitutes us as infinitely guilty, then we can move into the political realm where we have to start using judgment about distribution. We have to start using judgment about not everybody can count equally relative to limited resources, limited time, and limited access. So that's where he then, I think, is going to articulate, no, I can account for self-concern for, you know, historical injustice, but it's going to be a political issue, not a moral one. But you can see why people would have issue <laughs> with his yeah. kind of displacing that, right? Especially in a time of identity politics that wants to run those historical injustices all the way down. He's saying, no, 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 no. They are secondary to who I am constituted by the um, infinite obligation of every other. And the third pressure point is it seems like that this account is either, I think there's two sides of the same coin, radically utopian, <laughs> right? That, man, it seems really hard to see how we're going to pull this off. We're going to somehow live this out. There's too many narcissists. There's too many egoists. There's too many selfies running around, right? Like we, we are a culture defined by self-interest get yours, get your money. <clears throat> Don't worry about the other person. Run them over if you need to. The you know habits of highly influential people is kind of ethical only in so far as it's still serving your interests to be successful, influential. Levinas is the guy saying, I don't have the power to be powerful. I am essentially, uh, the words he used is hostage to the other. He says that we are hemorrhaging because think about it, like you've got um, you're, you're bleeding and you can't close the wound. He says that's like the ethical encounter. There is no way to shore yourself up from the trauma that constitutes you as never self-sufficient. So it seems like this is utopian in a way that we'd say, well, you know what? Screw it. Let's just go be good consequentialists. <laughs> Let's just go be good, uh, you know, virtue ethicists. I can do something with that. 
Levinas seems to eliminate our ability to do work. But the mirror image of that utopianism is what I would describe as a kind of quietism. Look, if I'm infinitely obligated to each and every other, no matter what I do, I've not done enough, <laughs> right? I mean, you see the worry, right? Mm. It, uh, the example I sometimes use here is, imagine you're a, a Red Cross helicopter pilot going into a flooded area that has been destroyed by a tsunami or whatever, and you, you hurricane or something, and people are on their roofs, and you go in to save people, right? Let's say that your carrying capacity of a helicopter is only 10 adults, so do you save 10 adults? Do you save 20 children? Do you save five adults and 10 children? Like notice, maybe you even stretch it and you get 11 adults on, even though you know that now it's going to be a push to get back with the gas that you've got. Like, mm. but here's the thing. However you do that, whatever choice you make, you're risking your life to go save the other, to give your last ounce of energy to help them and necessarily you didn't save everybody. Mm. Right? Now, if there's only eight adults on top of roofs, now you can pull it off. That's not the world we live in, <laughs> right? Yeah. So save the 10, you stretch to 11. Maybe you've got just a real skinny dude in there at 12, but you left 300 or even one behind. You are infinitely guilty. No matter what you've done, you didn't do enough because remember, there is no limit to who counts as the other. Mm. That one is just as much other, just as much morally obligated as the ones I saved. So the worry is a kind of quietism. If I can't do enough, why even bother? Let's go get drunk. Let's go have some fun. Again, let's go get mine. I'm going to drive a Porsche. <clears throat> Screw it. Because if I don't, if I sacrifice and work and struggle and do all for the other, I'm still infinitely guilty of not having done enough for the other. So these are the three worries, non-human others, <laughs> the marginalized or victimized other, and then how do I reconcile the tension between the worries of utopianism and quietism? Ultimately, these, I think, are the real pressure points that have dominated uh, the Levinasian scholarship for probably the last you know, 20, 25 years. Mm. That's such a wonderful analysis. And I suppose there's two things which immediately come to mind. Firstly, when you're raising the point about the, about being responsible for everyone else, as you say, it does tie in very strongly to the Dostoevskian idea of, of you being responsible for everyone around you. And I always have the image in my mind when I think it's Alyosha in the Brothers Karamazov mm -hmm. asks, asks uh, Father Zosima where he's like, well, how, what am I meant to do with all of this? And he's like, you have to be responsible for not only your sins, but the sins of everyone else around you. And That's I, right. That that image always just kind of stays in my head a lot when you're thinking, how much does that responsibility lie on your shoulders? And the answer is, it is significant. And 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 this, I suppose, ties into my other point, which is is where Kierkegaard perhaps um ties into to Lebanas. Is when I was reading <clears throat> today, I'm reading uh, I was reading the concept of dread in preparation for an upcoming discussion on our existential talks podcast on this channel so if you're interested in the existential talks podcast where i discuss existentialism with my dear friend lawrence who also at oxford then make sure you go check it out i'll put a link to that in the wherever the info, info bar appears on the screen but you can find it in one of those links it would appear soon but essentially i was coming across this passage in the concept of dread which reads that the ma that man is an individual and as such is at once himself and the whole race in such in such wise that the whole race has been part has part in the individual and the individual has part in the whole race and i suppose there's the idea of how one person can represent the entire race and the individual cannot be separated from it just as the race cannot be separated from the individual and i suppose with that idea in mind how would you view one's relationship to the other in the sense that is the other the race is it the individual is it the individuals within the race, how, how does that um, work together, I suppose? Yeah. Well, so it hits on a kind of um, Hebraic Jewish idea that, you know, when you save the life of another, you save all of humanity. And Levinas will talk a lot about this concept of humanity. And I, I, I think that for him, these are, again, two sides of the same coin. So why is it that I am concerned about or obligated by my relation to the other? 
because it is only in that radical um, self-dispossessing relation to the other that something like humanity as a value proposition emerges. It's only because each other is absolutely other. Derrida will describe this as tu autre et tu autre, which is him cribbing Levinas and then trying to extend these ideas uh, more broadly. Every other is absolutely other. That's the condition of something like humanism. Um, but Levinas has a, a essay book where he talks about humanism of the other person. And that's important because traditionally how we have thought about humanism is this, you know, man is the measure of all things kind of idea, right? And this then again is still anchored in this sort of egoism. Man's the measure of all things. I am a man. Therefore, I am the measure of all. Like you end up with this kind of reductive egoism that, you know, sometimes yields really cool stuff in history, but it's still ultimately threatening to reduce our sharedness to a kind of ontological principle by which ego emerges again on the backside. Hmm. What would it look like if that which we share is not something that goes all the way down so that ego can reemerge, but that which we share is actually something that is shared insofar as each and every other is absolutely other to me. Now humanity emerges, right? as the category of moral awareness. Instead of humanity emerging as an ontological concept by which we're able to individuate particulars, again, think objects in the world, oh, humanity is these objects as a group, right? No, it's, it's the other person as the ground for any conception of a shared humanity. So it's not based in me, it's based in the, the infinite uh, status of each other as individually other. And only on that basis can then humanism emerge as this um, lived attempt to take seriously what I sometimes refer to as um, the, the realization that justice for all always clumps and groups and de-singularizes the, the, the neighbor, the other. Justice for each now constitutes humanism as the task of justice, but it's never erasing the radical singularity of each and every other. So what is my relationship to the other? Levinas's answer, I would suggest, is to do all that I can for the other. And you say, yeah, 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 but there's a bunch of others. Exactly. That's why justice is demanded. That's why institutions have to be formed. That's why we can't think that ethics can stand alone. Ethics is always in tension with politics. Morality is always in tension with justice. And it's a tension that's productive, right? Think about it. <laughs> if I am in relation to the other, it's constituting me, constituting my moral life, and then I'm also in relation to other others. Well, that means then that these are protecting each of the other from going too far. If it's just me and the other, there is no justice. There is no third person. We're right back to the worry of coupling that we saw in time and the other, right? Mm -hmm. I can just, it's just me and you, Joshua. I'm going to take care of you. All the rest falls away. Mm -hmm. Well, now notice I'm guilty of ignoring all of the others because I've given it all to you. But at the same time, if I think, no, 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 it's just this multiplicity of the they, it's just the fact that there's a whole bunch, it's just distributive justice, can I do what I need that's put in place laws and instantiate legal realities and social structures so that I can really care about myself? Then Levinas says, ah, wait a minute, which others are falling out, mm. right? So you've You've done this work because you've got to do some sort of social work of institutions building. He'll say at one point, the liberal state is required, not because liberalism's ontology is right, but because the liberal state allows for that charity after justice. Mm -hmm. We need the liberal state. We need democracies, says Levinas. The problem is what happens in democracies? 
we tend to say, hey, America had a black president. Racism's done, right? Like mm. we end up forgetting the face of the needy other. We, yeah. we put in place a great policy to help with child care. And then we forget you know, the immigrants at the border. Oh, well, we mm. fix our immigration system. Fantastic. Well, have we forgotten our health care, right? So the whole mm. point is the two will always pull each other back from going too far to where we become coupled which is actually an abandonment of our moral responsibility, mm -hmm. or we've become uh, generalized, strategic, which forgets mm -hmm. the singularity of the demand. And mm -hmm. that I think is a really, really productive tension. And in fact, in my book, God and the Other, this tension is what I highlight as the most significant part of living Levinasianly, is mm -hmm. that we never forget that tension. And it always should animate how we live in the world with ourselves and others. If we go too far one direction, ethics is going to pull us back. If we go too far in the other direction, justice pulls us back. And that tension is, I think, maybe what mature, morally aware, socially responsible adulthood looks like to the best of our ability. That sounds a really interesting and a really important thing to keep in mind, because, of course, there's always those... I suppose I wouldn't I wouldn't go so far. Potentially even the word dialectics can um mm -hmm. suit it, but there is always, of course, that conflict of emotion and conflict of those two reasons within ethical thinking and ethical decision making, which are always present. You have good arguments for both of them. It's all about finding a mix between the two. If you've been enjoying this interview with Dr. Aaron Simmons so far, then make sure to like and subscribe and share it with your friends. If you'd like to support our mission to continue providing top quality philosophical content for free on YouTube, then go check out our Patreon. The link will be in the description below. Let's carry on with the video. Perhaps developing on from the other, what would the transcendence be for Levinas? What, what, what are his views on the transcendence and what does it mean? Yeah, so again, he starts off with that being the big question, right? That's where we started. That was, I said, all of his philosophy was basically trying to find transcendence. And his worry is that totality again, think Hegel, Heidegger, that totality is inescapable. Well, transcendence eventually for Levinas, as we've discussed, gets discovered in the face of the other, in the ethical relation that constitutes my own selfhood, constitutes what it means to be singularized by my responsibility rather than singularized by my particular instantiated freedom. Well, <clears throat> How then should we think about transcendence on the other side of this story Levinas has told? And I actually think here, transcendence then ends up naming not just a static thing, but a kind of task. So transcendence is about the constant attempt to transcend the temptations to uh, egoism, to self-concern, to groupings uh, with like-minded or like-embodied people transcendence now grounded in the face of the other as ultimately the transcendent that leads to a life seeking transcendence. And that becomes our moral and political task. And later Lebanon will actually say that ultimately he was never really concerned about ethics, which of course is a weird claim. He says, this was not my theme. He says, the real theme of my philosophy was holiness. Now, that might sound too religious for some, but the idea here, I think, is what I'm describing as a life-seeking transcendence, where holiness, notice, is different than did I do my ethical duty? Was I ethical? Those end up being kind of box-checking in the way we make sense of them. Holiness becomes a task for a lifetime. If you think back to faithfulness in Kierkegaard, I think holiness, a life of transcendence, these are versions of what I, in my work, refer to as faithfulness as the task of human existence. So transcendence is being invested in the cultivation of holiness, the right tension between ethics and politics that is always aware of the remaining guilty status. I've never done enough, but also pushes me forward so that I don't get overwhelmed and overrun by the temptations to utopianism and quietism. And so for me, you know, what would that look like? I tend to think of it um, sort of like a, 
um, marathon runner <laughs> who, who I do not run marathons, uh, but I have friends who do. And imagine, you know, a marathon where the goal is structurally impossible. I need you to run a marathon, um, but it's not going to be 26 miles. It's going to be 26,000 miles. Well, this is impossible for beings like us. What if I want you to run 26, you know, point uh, two miles, but you've got to do it in an hour? Impossible for beings like like so. It's a structurally impossible thing. Well, <laughs> our normal inclination, right, is to just say, "Screw this stuff. I'm going to go get some ice cream." Like, why would I try? Why would I run as hard as I can if I can't pull this off? I can't win. Notice the way that that logic is rooted still in egoism, <laughs> right? If I can't win, what's the point? If there's no way to complete this and check the box and be successful, I'm not even going to try. But what Levinas and I would suggest Kierkegaard, this is where the two come together. I would also suggest this is where Derrida's notion of justice to come emerges. All of these approaches are approaches that say the real question of human existence and the question of transcendence as a task, of faithfulness as a task, is not how do I be successful? It's how can I do all I can do for as long as I have the ability to do it? So I can't finish this race, but I don't want to be the person who sits down and doesn't try. I want to run as hard as I freaking can because I want to have been someone who ran, <laughs> right? It ends up being, it, it reframes, we reframed humanism and what counts as humanity. We reframed ethics and obligation and its relation to freedom. Now we're reframing what is the goal of life? The goal of life is not to be successful, check the box. The goal of life ends up to be faithful, to be developing holiness as a mode of investment in running as hard as I can for as long as I can. And maybe I don't pull it off. <laughs> maybe I'm still guilty when I save those 12 people and for the others... But am I haunted by those other? Do I get back in the plane as quick as I can to go get as many more as I can? Or am I the person, heck, man, I saved 12 people. You only saved nine. Suck it. I'm out. Like, I'm going to go get a beer. Notice that person is a horrible human being, even though they did their ethical duty, right? That's what Levinas is trying to challenge. Don't think of transcendence as a thing we have done. Think of it as something that always calls us ever more into what there is left to do. And that's why when I say Levinas be, might be one of the most helpful and radically important thinkers for where we are in the world, think about how different our world would be if we all said, how can I be more invested rather than less? How can I care more about the other rather than only about myself? How can I find ways to be more inclusive rather than more excluding? Those are fundamentally different ways forward, but they are a difference. I suggest, and this is my Camping with Kierkegaard book inspired by Levinas and Kierkegaard. I would suggest this is why faithfulness as a way of life, holiness as a way of life, is a fundamental movement into transcendence rather than getting the transcendent and then being able to articulate it and pin it down like a moth on a you know, child science fair. Man, what if we instead cultivate butterfly gardens, <laughs> right? Mm. That idea is more what I think transcendence means for him as a mature thinker. That's a very beautiful idea. And I think thinking about how much responsibility and, and thinking about where we are in, in the world in relationship to other people is something that we always have to keep in mind going through your day-to-day -day life. How can I... How can I improve myself in relationship to others? Always setting that standard above yourself, I think, is something which has helped me a lot in my life, really helped me recognize how much more I have to go, keeping yourself humble, keeping yourself going, and something which I think is a very good thing to have in mind, and especially, as you say, it's something to always work with and something always to develop from. And perhaps tying to the idea of the transcendence, what would you say was Levinas's view of the infinity? Is it something quite similar or was his conception quite different? Yeah, I mean, so his his famous book, Totality and Infinity, it's important to understand that infinity for Levinas is not um, a, a radical dichotomy in the sense that you have one or you have the other. It's 
infinity shows up precisely because totality typically frames how we live in the world. So it's not that infinity, the face of the other, the moral demand, the infinity of my obligation just erases or wrecks my uh, lived existence in the world. It's in fact, because I am historically situated, because I have these historical markers, Levinas's comment about the SS officer, my comment about white supremacy, et cetera, our histories shape where it is that we are in the world, in the totality that continues to always threaten to be the last word. So infinity is always linked to totality with the and, right? It's not totality or infinity. It's totality and infinity. The name of the book is important. And the and works to make sure that that depth is never ending but it shows up precisely in the space where we are always tempted to end it. <laughs> it. It's that tension that infinity shows up constantly as, again, this reminder. So in the same way that we find ethics and politics in tension, totality and infinity is also a kind of tension that plays out in our lives, seeking transcendence, seeking holiness every day. Hmm. That's a very interesting idea. And perhaps you've touched upon infinity being seeking holiness every day. Let's tie it on a bit further and say, what is Levinas's view on religion? Mm. Of course, you said he had a Jewish background. What are his yeah. views on religion as a whole and also his relationship with religion and Judaism? Yeah. Uh, so, so this question is uh, way bigger than we have time to get into. And so I'll give mm. you just a kind of uh, bookends maybe uh, and, 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 People can um, read my work or, or work of others who've done really good stuff on this. Um, Jeff Kosky did a, a really good book. So the idea is this. Levinas is Jewish. <laughs> um, his, his particular take on Judaism plays out most explicitly in his Talmudic writings, Talmudic readings, these books that are basically essays um, engaging the... the um, Talmud and the lessons there, the way that that makes sense. And he's trying basically um, in these works to go the opposite direction, right? So most of his work is taking Hebraic wisdom, translating it into Greek. And in these Talmudic writings, what he's effectively trying to do is unpack the Hebraic wisdom and, and make sense of it on its own terms without always the translation then into the kind of philosophical or phenomenological vernacular. But when it comes to <laughs> religion, um, Levinas approaches the idea both of God and religion via his uh, broader account of this moral um, framing. Now, he would say, no, I approach moral framing of the universe and ontology, rethinking these things because of understanding what was already there in these Hebraic ideas, right? So, uh, depending where you put the emphasis, it's kind of you know which direction you want to travel in. But I would suggest that for most readers, the way to make sense of this is Levinas understands um, God as not you know a supreme being who is articulated with particular predicates that would be identified in a classical theistic way such that god is omnipotent and omniscient and omnibenevolent and unchanging and so we make sense of god as this like standard bearer for all that is human um notice that kind of model which of course many um monotheistic jewish thinkers articulate and hold and affirm but that model for Levinas is troubling because it still locates God and being as this kind of, you know, er category by which we then are made sense of as similar or instantiated um, instances of this shared capacity with the divine. Instead, Levinas will say in a book um, of God who comes to mind, which is a very strange title, but he basically says God is. Um, emerges as, um, this is a, again a weird way to put it, but God emerges as the impetus or the um, sending toward the other, but it emerges only when the face of the other is visible. And so the way he'll put it is the trace 
T-R-A-C-E, the trace of God, shows up in the face of the other. <laughs> so it's not that there's this relation to God that sends me to the other person, right? In, in a, a way that for Kierkegaard, um, you know, I am commanded, thou shalt love the neighbor as yourself. God becomes the kind of great sending as this relationship by which the neighbor appears as a category. And that's why God is the middle term in uh, all works of love for Kierkegaard. For Levinas, God is in some ways um, the afterthought, <laughs> right? It's, it's God comes to mind because this radical encounter with the other is first. And then we say, <clears throat> well, what does it mean to relate to the other in this way, in a way that holiness becomes possible? Well, now it seems like we're kind of talking in a religious domain. And so he'll use a lot of religiously framed words to animate what's going on in this philosophical account of ethics. Just a couple examples. He will say <laughs> that um, ultimately ethics is a kind of eschatological or spiritual optics. What does that mean? Well, it's basically if I see the other via the lens of ethics, I am always seeing the other relative to the possibility of their flourishing. Well, at some level, isn't that what prophecy kind of means, <laughs> right? Is that I'm living into what is possible, but is impossible without this kind of awareness of beyond, the awareness of more. And so that excessive overflowing dimension is what Levinas will often use religious language to make sense of. So he talks about prophecy. He'll talk about eschatology. He'll talk about um, <clears throat> prayer as a kind of uh, brokenness in relationship to the obligation of the other. So his way of making sense of religion, I would suggest is, and again, this is, I'm trying to catch this out in a kind of standard reading, but there's lots of debates and a lot of people who would then move in different directions. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe I can put it this way safely. Um, it, it, Levinas's Judaism would be misunderstood if it is immediately positioned in terms of theism. Mm -hmm. um, God as another other is very much a question mark. Um, and Levinas seems explicitly to reject that idea. God is not another other. God seems to show up as, again, this trace or depth uh, on the backside of the other's signification. Mm -hmm. And I know that sounds weird, and I'm actually struggling to not make it even more abstract, <laughs> because <laughs> this is where Levinas gets, I think, the hardest, um, because he's trying so hard, in my opinion, not to fall just into theology. Um, mm -hmm. which I think he successfully avoids doing. Um, but he is not, he's not scared of this deeply religious language. Holiness, he says, has been my theme from the beginning, right? Um, and these ideas get picked up, of course, in Derrida, who will then talk about messianism, you know, and, and talk about these different ways of making sense of religion without religion. There, that idea, I actually think is, anchored in a very particular Levinasian uh, understanding. Mm -hmm. That's that's really wonderful. And perhaps end off this video. Uh, yeah. Are there any books you would recommend people to read in, to, in order to either understand Levinas or any books written by Levinas himself that you would recommend people to start off with? Yeah. He, so Levinas, like most of the thinkers I spend a lot of time reading, um, sometimes digging into their work is probably the worst thing you can do for, for, for understanding them. Um, cause it, it, I mean, Kierkegaard is a great example where like, well, which book do you start with? All of the standard suggestions are written by pseudonyms and it's him like play acting relative to a different idea. So it, you know, it's like, well, I'm going to start with either or yeah, but none of those views in there are really Kierkegaard. Like, so it's complicated Levinas is complicated for a different reason. And it's owing to the fact that 
he is more or less assuming, and this is a big assumption, not only that his readers have fully integrated and understood uh, Husserlian and Heideggerian phenomenology. Like that's just a taken for granted that you know all of this, <laughs> but also that you more or less fully appreciate the history of Talmudic interpretation. <laughs> like that's also just kind of in play. And by the way, make sure that you also have read all the Russian masters because they're forming his imaginative backdrop, right? Like it, it's hard because none of this um, is presented in very systemic ways where he's kind of laying out his intellectual biography so you can catch up. Um, in fact, I say somewhere <laughs> that Heidegger is at his best when he's reading other thinkers. Levinas is almost always at his worst when he's reading other thinkers because he's selective in his appropriation. He's reading them for his own purposes and his own ends to articulate this big philosophical view. And so it only works if you kind of already understand all of that history so that you can then see the selectivity operative in the way that he's deploying these thinkers. So that's just a caveat, right? Levinas is hard to read, very hard to read. I would say the uh, best place to go, in my opinion, is actually a book of interviews. <laughs> and it's a book of interviews um, between Emmanuel Levinas and a guy named Felipe Nemo, N-E-M-O, Felipe Nemo. And um, in that book, it's, it's just called Ethics and Infinity. Um, what you get is a set of interview questions from Felipe Nemo, more or less asking Levinas the big questions about his philosophy. And in the context of a short series of interviews, Levinas has got to kind of control himself. <laughs> so, so his answers are um, sometimes opaque, but they're short so you can kind of unpack them. You can try to get a better sense of it. And in those essays, Nemo does a nice job also of asking questions about Levinas's history, about where his ideas came from, about how he got to where he is. Um, just what happens, I've got this book right next to me. So it's Ethics and Infinity, uh, Conversations with Felipe Nemo. Highly recommend that as a first place to go. And it goes through um, his kind of early work through his mature uh, work as well. So that's a good one. Um, no, if you want, however a suggestion for some books that are kind of like secondary works on Levinas. So again, Ethics and Infinity with Felipe Nemo, that's Levinas primary, but it's an interview. And so it's way better, I think, to get into um, two books. There's a, a book called Levinas, The Guide for the Perplexed um, by a guy named um, Hutchins. That's a pretty good book. It does, a, again, a kind of accessible for the undergraduate reader. I've used it in some of my classes before to start um, by, by teaching Levinas to folks. Um, but there's also a series of books. Um, Ethics as First Philosophy is a good one um, by Adrian Pepperzak. And Pepperzak was a kind of um, right at the, the front end of bringing Levinas to an English audience. And so his books remain standards um, as uh, kind of introductions to this Levinasian project and how it, how it works. And if anybody's interested in Levinas as situated within the broader movement of new phenomenology or recent French phenomenology. The book I wrote with Bruce Ellis Benson just called The New Phenomenology, A Philosophical Introduction, was intentionally written not to introduce readers to Levinas or to Marion, but to Levinas, Marion, Derrida, Chrétien, and Henri, these five new phenomenologists, as a philosophical project. And so they differ in different ways, but that book was intentionally written as an introduction, which there are not many on the market, it turns out, with, with this set of thinkers, um, as an introduction to the philosophical ideas that they, in unison and yet some interesting divergence, carry forward as a discrete philosophical project. Um, so uh, that, that book as well, I think, would be maybe helpful to people. Talking about books, are, are there any projects you're currently working on? Yeah, so I mentioned last time we spoke a book that is finished, still trying to land it with the right publisher, um, just called Camping with Kierkegaard, Essays on Faithfulness as a Way of Life. And if people are excited about that one, let me encourage them to get signed up for my monthly newsletter over at jrnsimmons.com because that's where I'm sort of you know, keeping people apprised 
and we're going to have a launch party there, do some streaming involved whenever it does find the right press. We're going to really push it hard uh, through that medium. But I'm also this summer working on a book uh, with a friend of mine, and it's going to be focused on the film Everything Everywhere All at Once. And we're going to try to use that film to introduce a broad audience to the basic philosophical notion of postmodernism. So those are the two books that I'm working on uh, right at this minute. Again, one's finished looking for a press. The other is just getting started. And so we're going to hopefully knock out a bunch of pages this summer between some trout fishing and mountain biking and uh, camping with my family. That sounds absolutely wonderful. So make sure that if you're interested in that, then go check out his website. I'll put it in the description below. Once again, thank you very much for coming on to talk about Emmanuel Levinas. It's been an absolutely wonderful interview. I think I've learned so much more about Levinas and I'm sure the audience have as well. If you want more content like this, where I'm interviewing, talking to different professors about their fields of interest and philosophy, then let me know in the comments below about what you want to see next on the channel. And I'll try my best to make those videos for you. Stay safe, my friends. See you soon. Thank you for watching and God bless. I'll see you next one and goodbye.